Pro University back in session. This is Angles 201. Today we're going to talk about the geography of the ice, we're going to talk about box control, we're going to talk about playing the rush, and we're also going to execute a watermelon. One of the first things that we have to understand as a goaltender when it comes to positioning and playing the angles is how to handle the rush. And over the years, there's been a couple of changes in how goalies position themselves as the rush develops. There's two ways to play it. You can play the angle from the inside out, and you can play the angle from the outside in. Let's take a look at both of those, and I'll tell you which one is a preferable way to play. When you play the rush from the outside in, You'll see the goalie hanging out well out in front of the crease and as the rush develops and approaches the goaltender they will back up with the play shifting readjusting their angle trying to stay in the middle of that shooting triangle now as a young goaltender you can get away with that but as soon as you play with high level people that can execute diagonal passes the game speeds up you're always going to be finding yourself leading with your butt off angle not in the middle of the shooting triangle so all college all junior and all pro goalies play the angle the opposite of outside in. They play it inside out. What does that mean? Quite simply, as the play's at the other end, you'll see all the goalies in the NHL with their shoulders on the crossbar. As the play starts to develop, they make a read. It comes towards center ice. It gets very close to the blue line. And then what you'll see the goalies do is tap off from the goal line, either using their stick or glove, depending on which side the rush is developing from. And then they'll rotate and step straight out on that angle. That puts you dead in the middle of the shooting triangle. By starting back, referenced with the net, and then tapping off and stepping out to the top of the crease, you're always playing the rush chance dead in the middle of the shooting triangle. So be like the NHL guys. Start with your shoulders on the crossbar as the rush develops, then get yourself out to the top of the blue crease. Now the only caveat and the only difference would be if it's a breakaway. And then of course, we use our Y theory by stepping four or five feet out in front of the crease and backing up as the breakaway guy attacks. So the best way to play the rush, starting back inside the crease, tapping off and stepping out to the top of the crease. I'm an old guy, 53 years old, and when I went to Howie Meeker's hockey school back in the 70s, I heard about the geography of the ice. Now, the geography of the ice quite simply means the markings on the ice form different geometric patterns and angles that in the past they would teach us to rely upon those to help position yourself in the net. I'm going to talk to you about why that should be avoided and why it's kind of a risky business to put yourself in a proper angle that you believe is correct based on what you see out in front of you. Now, a pro goalie could be perfectly positioned on white ice out in the river without any paint on the ice. And they do that by tapping off because when you're referencing yourself by starting right in the middle of the net and then stepping out, you're always going to be in the middle of the shooting triangle. You don't need visual markings to help you position where you are in the net. There are some cues that you can rely upon in warm-up to help check. And one would be symmetry. A lot of arenas are designed symmetrical. Meaning if you look down the ice to the far end, there is a line straight up the middle of the roof line. Most buildings are like that. However, when you get in three and four sheet buildings, sometimes that roof line is not something you can rely upon. As well as the lights. A lot of times the lights form the center angle all the way down to the middle of the ice to the other net. And you can use that as sort of a visual reference. Check it and warm up. Not reliable because every rink is different. So you think about the markings on the ice. You have your defensive zone dots your neutral zone dots, your circles, the slot. And there's a couple things here that we can look at to try to look at the geography of the ice and how it used to be taught. So obviously the net at the far end is a good thing that you can reference from because it's straight ahead in front of you, which means the net behind you is straight behind you. So from the center angle, it's very easy to find that center angle by just looking down at the other net and visually placing yourself in the middle of that other net. That'll put the net behind you in the middle as well. Now, if you look at the angles, the face-off dots typically have a line that would run from the face-off dot through the little hash mark on the corner of the crease right to the middle of the net. Some rinks are different. That's the way it should be designed if the rinks are laid out properly. The second one you can sort of find is the neutral zone dot just outside the blue line. 
If you draw a line from that neutral zone dot, it should just touch the side of the face-off circle, come right through your crease, right to the middle of the net. That's another positional cue that you can use. You can maybe check in warm-ups. But overall, I'm telling you this, you can't rely upon the markings on the ice. Here's why. Every arena is different. Now in the NHL, a lot of the arenas are virtually identical dimensionally, but in the past, the Boston Garden would be a different width compared to the old Maple Leaf Gardens, etc. And you know as a goaltender, sometimes when you play an Olympic sheet of ice, your angles are way off. That's why we always got to keep coming back to tapping off on the rush to help center you. You can't rely upon the arena markings. They vary from rink to rink. And one final thing about that, I grew up in small town Ontario in Strathroy. And I know for a fact in August, when they went out to paint the rink markings, the guys that work at the rink probably don't care if they get them exactly perfect. You may not want to rely upon that. So at the end of the day, take a survey in the warm up to see where sort of things are, check behind you, work on some positionings when you're in a brand new building, but don't rely upon arena markings, rely upon tapping off. <music>was a kid in Strathroy growing up, I think probably 12 years old, a goaltender from the NHL named Marv Edwards and another guy named Dave Dryden, obviously his brother's a little bit more famous, they showed up and they showed us the angle ropes. They hooked up these ropes to the posts along the ice, they hooked up the posts to ropes at the crossbar, and it formed a three-dimensional geometric space so we could visualize the area where pucks could go in the net or miss the net. And we understood by seeing that visual demonstration how that three-dimensional space changed depending on the angle. It helped us understand that a lot of times we're covering over the net and the importance of controlling that little box in the middle with our gloves projected or challenging appropriately so we're playing the box properly. We're going to take a look at a bunch of NHL goalie clips and really drill down now into box control and what it really looks like and what it means. Nowadays, it's been very popularized and brought back to the forefront by the Swedish goalie coaches who've done a great job with it. So I want to elaborate a little bit further so you can really drill down and understand box control. Here we see King Henrik Lundqvist. He's known for playing quite deep. As a result, he typically has a much bigger area to cover, or if you will, a bigger box area to control. In his prime, this was not an issue, but now he can struggle managing this deep in the net. In this photo, we see Andrew Raycroft in an issue he quite commonly had where he put his gloves in front of his hips. Because he minimized his width of coverage by placing his gloves here in front of his hips, the box control becomes much tougher. It allows a ton of room beside his body for puck access. Here's an extra tidbit. Razor tended to close his gloves off in his stance. Using Photoshop, I showed him where I wanted to see that trapper. It would help him in the long run by being in a better place before the shot was released. On this clip here, we see Turco playing a poor angle shot, and the ropes show us where Pavelski is probably aiming. In a very similar angle, we also see the angle ropes outlining the available space for Dupuy to hit. And here we see how goalies in the NHL recognize this very thin area available on the poor angle by closing up and restraining their pad flare. Although I'm not sure Gerber closing his eyes is the way to go. So now get ready to see what happens when you allow an immature person like me to control a lethal weapon like a puck machine. Over the years at the hockey school, this has been a fan favorite of the kids. They also smell better. So sit back and enjoy the execution of Freddy the Watermelon. So that's it for Angles 201. Friday, 6 a.m. is Angles 301 as Future Pro University opens up again. There we're going to talk about situational positioning, the problem with falling in love with the back door, and the importance of holding your ground. See you then.